This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Silvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is April 20th, 2024. Jonathan Osborne here, as always, joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, the Magic were losers in Game 1. First and foremost, how are we feeling? Is everything okay? Are people overreacting? Is the sky falling? Sort of, where are you? People are always overreacting. So, yes to that. They're going to be overreacting. I've seen some really egregious things being said at this point. Uh, The biggest one being like, the season's over. That's just clean house. It's like, calm down. It's a seven game series. And what's the old adage says like a playoff series doesn't start till the away team wins. So who knows? Maybe the magic. Cause that's the thing too, man. Like the magic, the magic played terrible, awful. And largely this, like the magic were within like, I felt like seven to eight points the entire game and they were playing terrible. I mean, we're talking about a team that shot 32 and a half percent from the field, not from three from the field. So, and, and also held the Cavs to under a hundred. And so for me, uh, the sky's not falling. Uh, And as someone who predicted this, if I'm being honest, like this is exactly what I laid out on the last episode. You pack the paint, you fall in, you you try to win the game with threes, you're not hitting your shots, it is what it is, you lose the game. But I I can't say I'm shocked, but I am shocked that you shot thirty some percent from the field. That is worse than I thought was gonna happen, that's for sure. So sky's not falling, man. Um <laughs> you and I know how's that know how this goes. We saw it several times throughout the season. The Magic would lose two in a row. We'd hop on here and be reactionary to a point and be negative and constructive and all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden they win two, three in a row. And the next pod, it's the vibes are completely different. It's the exact experience we could have if the Magic win game two in Cleveland. It's a seven game series. Don't panic yet. And, and to be honest, don't panic till you lose one at home. I think that's something I'm going to live by in this series. Really quickly, just want to give uh, everybody a special shout out who came out to the watch party uh, Saturday. Was super hot. Uh, I I took my own advice, drank tons of water, wore a nice big hat, wore sunscreen, all of that, and it was still like crazy, freaking hot. Uh, but yeah, I, I want to say we had easily over a thousand people there. Like crazy. definitely more than uh, we had for the the lottery watch party last May. Mm. Um, it's whole city coming out, bringing the energy. It was a ton of fun. Another one Monday night. There's not going to be any, you know, blistering heat like there was Saturday. So uh, if you're in the area Monday night, that game is going to tip off around seven o'clock. I'll be back out there. Looking forward to that. Uh, again, just appreciate the entire city just showing out. It made for a, a great atmosphere when the magic started going on that run in the second half. Like it, it was just, it, it was great. So, Again, appreciate everybody that that came out. Uh, Kevin, as you and I are recording this Saturday night, Kevin is working on uh, editing the Six Fan Show. So as you're listening to this, that's prob- probably already up. So if you want to see some uh, Magic Fan reactions from folks who were at the watch party, uh, you can definitely do that on our YouTube. And producer Kevin, great job doing the post game live today after this game. There were some folks who were very reactionary. Sky was falling, but for the most part, People understand that, hey, this was sort of always a possibility. This was like worst case scenario, really. And uh, yeah, Magic just need to improve on some things heading into the next game. So be sure to tune in to producer Kevin's uh, post-game lives presented by Rockham live on YouTube following every Magic game throughout the the series here. And as you're listening to this either late Saturday or early Sunday, you're like, hey, wait a minute. This isn't Monday. This isn't Thursday. Why is the six-man show out? That's because we're doing episodes after every single playoff game. So game ended today. I drove straight home and now Luke and I are here recording overall thoughts from the game for me were, were, were that like, yeah, 
it was disappointing the way that the Magic just couldn't string offense together for long stretches. You know, they make that run in the second half to cut it to five. And then I think you're down 13 or, or 15 heading into the fourth quarter. And then uh, after like a minute into the fourth quarter, you're down by as much as 20. And the Magic, you know, sort of made their run and, and got it to nine or got it to eight in the fourth quarter. But just the the offense was completely non-existent today. I saw this tweet from Jackson Frank that I wanted to share here. He said the Magic generated 62.7 points per 100 possessions in the half court today. By far their worst mark of the season. It was previously 70.8. Also the best mark for the Cavs half court defense this season. So in the half court, this is basically the worst the Magic played all season. And this is the best the Cavs defended in the half court this season. A lot of that you can just chalk up to the Magic missing good looks. I don't feel like the the game seemed like it was too big for some of these guys, but I definitely think nerves played a role, especially early on in guys missing shots. But Luke, ultimately, that's what this game came down to. You alluded to it, but the Magic, 28 of 86 from the floor, 32.6%, 8 of 37 from behind the arc, good for 21.6% from the floor. And conversely, Cleveland shot 44% from the floor, and 26% from behind the arc. Cleveland didn't shoot the ball particularly well. They started the game off really hot. They shot five for five from behind the arc to start the game. And I think they made their first 14 of 18 shots from the floor. Luke, Paolo and Franz, which I know we'll talk about these guys individually, they shot 16 of 32 between the two of them. The rest of the team was 12 of 54. That's good for 22%. Gary Harris... Cole Anthony, Joe Ingles, Markel Fultz combined for 0 of 19 from the floor. Jalen Suggs was 4 of 16 from the floor. That's 4 of 35 from your guard group. That is never in any universe going to be good enough to get a win. I don't want to oversimplify this loss. You're 19 of 13 from the free throw line. Free throws, especially in the first half, sort of kept you in the game. But you make eight more free throws and you're in this game. You you make 11 of those free throws and you're down by two or down by three at the end of this game instead of just having to chuck threes like the last few minutes to try to make up ground and it was apparent the Magic weren't going to be able to do that. But I think today showed that this series is going to be what we thought it was. Like It's going to be a rock fight. It's going to be very defensive-minded. It's going to be ugly at times. It got a little chippier like earlier than I thought it was going to between Joe Ingles and George Niang and uh, Mo Wagner, especially like, I I just think we're in for a war. Like this is going to be a tough series. I don't think game one is indicative of how everything is going to go. I don't think the magic are going to shoot quite this badly again. And if if you just shoot, you know, 35% from three in this game, it feels like you're right in the middle of it. So Game one did not go the way that we wanted it to, but I'm encouraged still. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to take from it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the takeaway is just that the the magic couldn't hit anything. And also, it seemed like there was a lot of, a ton of stagnant offense there, especially in that first half. There was a ton. A lot of a lot of guys just standing around, not sure what to do. I don't know if that's like you know the the moment being huge thing for them if they're just kind of deer in headlights or what was going on. But obviously, Paolo shoots the ball well, but he also has what eight turnovers. Uh maybe one of them wasn't his fault. Maybe one, maybe two. He was shouldering a a, a quite the load today. And it showed uh, the the Cavs put him in some really bad situations. But also the good news is I think a lot of it was forced by Paolo. Like, I think he made it harder on himself than necessary things that he can look at the film and, and, and know what he needs to do to not have those turnovers again. It's the, the Cavs did play well defensively. There's no way around it. The magic get off to a bad start. And your confidence is shot, and the Cavs have you right where they want them. 
in these games against the Cavs, you ha- you have to get off to a fast start. I think it was your your appearance on Fear the Fro with Bob Schmidt that he was saying something the Cavs have done well is get off to fast starts. And the Magic have been victim lately, especially that they don't do that. But especially in Cleveland, that crowd was into it, Jonathan. They were into it from the tip, but they were especially into it after they start whatever it was, five of five. Donovan Mitchell hits a rainbow three. And it, and it just it felt like it was all in the entire first quarter was that way. The, the good news is you held the Cavs to 20 points in the second quarter and the third quarter, 24 in the fourth, 33. That first quarter killed you. Outscored by nine in that in that first quarter. Or seven, sorry. So, high, highest scoring quarter of the game, that first quarter, and then both defenses really tightened up. But if you're the Magic, you cannot have a, a, a quarter where you score 15 and follow that up with a quarter where you score 17. It, interestingly to me, those starters played some high minutes. The obviously you have your your duo, Franz with thirty eight minutes, Paolo with forty one, but Mosley felt like he had to do that because those were the only two guys that were able to get buckets in this game, aside from Mo Wagner, who was four of eight, only played thirteen minutes. We know why that is. So really interesting. It's a chess match from here on out. And this is where it gets interesting. Game two, how do you adjust if you're Jamal Mosley? And and how do you handle the rest of this series? But ultimately, the game in front of you, how, how are you going to play differently? And it's just crazy to me. There's so much to talk about with this game, but it was it was truly not. I expected it. I expected us to lose this game. Opening game, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse going to be rocking. I did not expect you to lose because you shot 30-some percent from from uh, the field. I think that's sort of like, not that I necessarily feel encouraged. Like mm-hmm. today was, was not a good result. Like the it, it went offensively about as bad as, as you could imagine. But if, if the Magic are, are just able to stay out of that zone of, of frustration from the lack of offense or like just the offensive struggles in general, if this is the way that they can defend for an entire series, which we've seen them do this all year long for the most part, I, I think you're going to have a chance. Are you, are you going to win this series? I don't know. <clears throat> but holding Cleveland to 97 points on the day, they made those first five threes, and then they missed the next 18 threes. Their, their next 18 attempts from behind the arc. Is that going to happen each game? Well, no, but they're also not going to start 5 of 5 from behind the arc. Cleveland today, I believe they shot 32% from, uh, from behind the... No, they shot 26% from behind the arc as well. Uh, I don't know why I felt like it was a, a bit higher than that, but their, their average is usually around 35 36%. That's where they've hovered for the most part of the year. Uh, but usually they shoot quite a, a a bit higher attempts today, only 30. Now the Magic win the possession battle. You know you have 86 attempts to Cleveland's 81, large part and due to Cleveland's turnovers. You forced them into 17 turnovers. The Magic had eight in the first half, five of those from Paolo Bancaro, and then the Magic had just four in the second half. So they had 12 the entire game. But it just does not feel like the Magic's guards are going to shoot th- four of 35 from the floor again. And and real quick, I'll add here too. If you look at like, okay, when you think of this team, who are the guys that you think of largely on the offensive end is like they're a guy that can get that can shoot a three and make it. For this team, I'd categorize that as Gary Harris, Jalen Suggs, Cole Anthony, Wendell Carter Jr., and Joe Ingles. Those are your five guys that you expect can hit just an open three. Legitimately, that's that's all like that's what they're that's on the offensive end, that's what they're good for, right? And in a vacuum, those five guys today, Jonathan, shot two of 19 from the three-point line. Those are your guys that you look to with a wide-open three, and you're like, okay, this guy can probably knock this down. But when you have a unit collectively shoot like that, 
and you're so used to them being able to at, at least hit an open shot from three. That's abysmal. That's game one of the playoffs. And you have to be better in game two. I don't think that comes as a shock. I don't think that's profound. But in game two, there is no way you are going to go out there and shoot two of 19 again from three. I'm saying that in terms of like, these guys can't afford to do that. Again, no secret, but I thought that was ridiculous. And guys like Gary Harris and Jalen Suggs together combining for one for 12 from three. So, game two, you got to come out and set the tone a lot better than that. Last year, the Cavs got out physicaled all series, entire series. Jared Allen, that quote that gets memed around to, the lights were brighter than expected. He's looking to reverse that. And it showed. Jared Allen in this one, 16 and 18. And the Cavs did such a good job. And maybe it's to the fault. It definitely is to the fault of Jonathan Isaacs. I'm too, but also the point of attack defenders for this magic team. Just getting to the point where like guys are the guards. Obviously you've got some really talented guards in the Cleveland side, but the last person that can come over to help in those situations is Jonathan Isaac, because you're giving up a free Jared Allen dunk. And I, I, and I don't know. I, I guess at that point, you're just hoping that J.I. can really turn it into a double team on the guard that gets past your defender and then make them make a, a, an error and pass or something. But that, it, that's how Jarrett Allen scored most of his buckets. So uh, I just, man, tough game. A lot of adjustments to be made, and I'm I'm super interested to see how Jamal Mosley handles it moving forward. Yeah, our guy Brandon uh, over at ORL Analytics on Twitter, he put out a a, a really uh, great graphic um, either at the beginning of this game or, or before the game, just uh, like highlighting um, like the best cutters in the league, like per cut, like points per cut, and Jared Allen and Evan Mobley are both in the 100 percentile in terms of best cutters in the league. I don't put so much of the blame on J.I. because like, what is he supposed to do? Just let Donovan Mitchell or, or Darius Garland sort of get right to the rim. But I do think that like Jared Allen and Evan Mobley like cutting, they did a good job of sort of neutralizing Jonathan Isaac's effect defensively. But when Jonathan Isaac rotates over to help, whoever is closest also needs to drop and help pick up either Evan Mobley or Jared Allen, whoever Jonathan Isaac is guarding at the time whether that be you know, Paolo Ban, Karen Movard, or like whoever is on the floor with him at that time, you can't just let these guys like run straight to the rim because at this point, like J.I. is coming over to help. He's literally underneath the basket and is not in a position to you know, try to uh, you know, contest a, a Jared Allen or, a, or an Evan Mobley at the rim. I did think that was a lot better in the second half. I think the point of attack defense was really good in the second half. Um, and that sort of helped slow down that Cleveland defense a little bit. But the Magic's offense just could never really totally get that going. Gary Harris, 0 of 6 from the floor, 0 of 5 from behind the arc. Jalen, 4 of 16 from the floor, 1 of 7 behind the arc. Those guys were terrible offensively. Defensively, I thought they were really good. Donovan Mitchell, 11 of 21. I mean, he was just making some tough shots today, like just point blank, 30 points. Darius Garland, 14.6 of 11. You're able to hold Darius Garland to 14. Like, I'm okay with that. We just can't let Evan Mobley have 16 and 11 and Jared Allen have 16 and 18. Like, that cannot happen. For the Magic, who are supposed to have a strength going into this series, like rebounding. Now, yes, Cleveland was able to come down with more rebounds because there were more shots to clean up, quite frankly, because the Magic couldn't make a shot. But you're out rebounded 54 to 40. And all the talk about the magic, like out physicaling Cleveland, like heading into this series from, from some of the different experts and analysts that you talk about, I felt like Cleveland did a good job matching our physicality. I do think we have a sort of another level to take that, right? I, I feel like there were, you know, a couple of baskets, you know, around the rim in particular that just came a little bit too easy for Cleveland. And I'm not going to sit here and like, cry about officiating officiating is is 
nowhere near the reason that you lost this game. But there were like quite a few instances where like Cleveland was getting regular season calls and you know guys on the other end for us were were not exactly getting those calls. But uh, for the most part, I didn't really have a, a massive problem with the way that this game was officiated. I think probably the worst call of the day was the Markel foul on George Niang that was deemed a flagrant. Like even in the regular season, I don't know that that's called a flagrant. And for they they said he wound up. It's like it was a shoulder check. It it was not like contact above the neck or anything like that. It was just a hard transition foul. And George Niang gets in uh, Markel's face, and he gets called for the technical. But Markel got called for the technical and the flagrant there as well. Didn't really understand that. But the Magic, like we mentioned, first half they really were able to stay in the game because of the free throw attempts. But nineteen for thirty. How much have we talked about this all year? Shooting from behind the arc, free throw shooting being the reason that you either you know lose games or games are closer than necessary. And like, people, what, what's the reason for free throw shooting? Is it lack of practice? Is it lack of focus? Like, I, I just don't understand how it's been a, a an issue for 82 games of the regular season, and either we haven't practiced them enough or. <laughs> We're not focused enough. It just does not make sense to me. It cannot happen in a playoff game. It's hilarious to me when people are like, lock them in the gym and make them shoot 100 free throws. It's like these are NBA players. They they know how to practice free throws. I bet, I'm willing to bet, they knock down their free throws and practice. It's all mental. It's all mental. And... Uh, it's a good glimpse into maybe, you know, guy, guys like Paolo, like his size, it's a little bit more usual for them to struggle with free throws. But when you look at this today and you look at free throws, I, I mean, <laughs> it's a it, Paolo shoots four of eight from the, from the free throw line. And that's largely where this comes from. Mo Wagner, two of four. And uh, it's, it's just, and, and Jalen sucks four of six. They everyone missed like one or two, right? And then Palo misses four. Regardless, it's all it, it's always going to be mental, unless you were just a big man with huge hands where the ball is like a tennis ball in your hands, trying to shoot a free throw. You don't really have an excuse, and it's likely you can chalk it up to the moment. All the fans screaming. And Rocket Mortgage with their their white out shirts, all that kind of stuff. Maybe that's what it is. But it, it, there's there's no world where it's like they just need to practice more. They shoot free throws enough, I'm sure. So yeah, the the free throw has been a problem all year. Why are they going to start making them now? The moment's bigger. They're not going to make it at the same clip, even that they did in the regular season, which by the way wasn't good. That's just my thoughts on it, though. This year at home, the Magic shot 77% at the free throw line and 74% on the road. So, like, they just suck at free throws. Like, yeah. maybe not suck, maybe isn't the, the right word, but like, suck in all respects, like, they're towards the bottom of the league in free throw percentage. Like, it's, it's just not great. And it sucks for a team that is one of the best teams in the league at getting to the free throw line. If they were able to capitalize on those, you know, some well, games this season would have went different, and there's a chance that this game today uh, ends up different. Thank God they get to the free throw line because they'd suck anyway at free throws. So if they were doing it minimally, you'd really be leaving points on, on the on the board. So, God, whatever, man. Free throws, just make your shots. How about that? I'd love for you to make your free throws, but that ship has kind of sailed. Well, hopefully they're able to to lock it in because I, I don't think the the physicality of this series is is really going anywhere. I found the the chippiness early on really fun. Like it, yeah. if this ends up being at least a competitive series for the Magic, I think it's going to be a, a lot of fun to watch. Just because I think there's going to be some tempers flaring throughout the series like oh. so, so you can already tell like certain guys on these teams don't really care for each other and that always makes for a good playoff series over under ejections a series one and a half 
Or are you going over or under? I'll probably ejections. say under, but like if you put it at a half, I'd say over. I think somebody yeah. will get ejected at some point during this series. Yeah. You, it's it's going to be one of George Niang, Joe Ingles, or Mo <laughs> Wagner. Yeah. It's going to be. That's no doubt about it. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. Give a quick shout out to the folks that help make each and every episode possible, our patrons. Uh, If you're listening to us throughout the playoffs here and you decide, hey, I want to help these guys do what they're doing and uh, join the cause and and help support us financially, you can join in on the fun at patreon.com slash the six man show where we have different tiers that you can choose from. Want to give a very special shout out to our newest patron, Stantino1995, who joined at the elite tier. Really appreciate that. Every time we have brand new patrons, We give them a special shout out just like that. And we give our Hall of Fame and Elite Tier patrons a special shout out each and every episode. I'll go ahead and start with the Court Cousins, Drew Gooden, Armin Carson, Tulo, Ellis, Jonathan Borges, Normal Magic Player History, Gabe Gaines, Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Michael Salapong, Donkey Punch, Dave, Paolo and Franz's Warmth, Pierre A, Dylan Holden, Mr. Mikey, Danimal, Bobby Skinner, Goatee93, Teddy Sylvia, Eric Lopez, Fuchsia, Bill Fulton, Emin Lagone, Jose Esquilin, Caleb Pete, Cannibalism, Time, Mr. TV, ESPN really sucks. Gear 95, Shred, Junior Bruce, Half Reekin, Shahin 177, Bulby the Dawn, Himlo, Ben Himro, RM Prof 221, Ray Pastrana, Magic Kid 714, Mysterious Mosley, Victor Cologne, Irish Magic Mike, Austin Lampy, Random Hustle, Only Franz, Maria, Keith Walls, Fritz, Currency Kev, Rub Sal, Case and Green, Santi Leon, Kane Eckler, The Distracted Mod, Simpson, Chansu, Tom Gatson, Dead Air, Richard Tuttle, Jeremiah Quintero, Magic Wire, Debo 1980, Magic Matt, Michael Thompson, Mama Richmond, Next Napa, What's Up Playoffs 2024, Dylan Fay, Sammy, David Duffy, Smith's Sheiks, Bueno Times, Stantino 1995. A big shout out to all of our patrons. Again, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. And uh, Jonathan, we can, we can talk a little chicken. Talk a little bit of chicken. Jam hot chicken. A little chicken. Talk a little chicken. Jam hot chicken, 400 West New England Avenue. You haven't heard us talk about them before. They are a Nashville and LA inspired hot chicken shack, locally owned and operated in beautiful Winter Park. Outside seating, beautiful place to go. Follow them on social media at Jam Hot Chicken and go ahead and find them online at jamhotchickenfl.com. Access online ordering, the menu, music playlists, and all things Jam Hot. Luke, what did you think of Powell and Franz Wagner today? Like both of those guys making their playoff debuts. The young stars, we knew that in order for the Magic to have a chance in this series, those those guys are really going to have to play well. Uh, what what do you make of their performances from today? Second half from Franz was much more pleasing to me than the uh, the first half. Paolo Bancaro, aside from the turnovers, was great. Five of ten in the second half from the field. Even in the first half, four of seven. I thought that he did well for what he was working with, i.e. his teammates not being able to hit a, a, a dang thing. I think he did well. But, you know, with, with him, it's like I said, it's all the turnovers. But Paolo, I genuinely, I, I really did come into this game expecting him to shoot poorly. Just because I knew he'd be getting a lot of attention. And I expected him to try to force some things. And he shot over 50% from the field in his debut. What was that stat? Was it Orlando Muse? ORL Muse on Twitter? Did you see that? What, like his stat line? Like only other guys who do that? 25 and 5. Yeah, I think it was. Of guys to go 25 and 5 in their first ever playoff game, it's him, LeBron, and Luka. I'm pretty positive that that was the list. Might be time to have a conversation. Screw that guy. Not you, Orlando Muse. Screw that guy. What was his name? Barrier of the Ringer. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I don't know what it is with like I, I'm not trying to take shots like at the Ringer because like you know we have Steve Saruta, we have Kevin Clark over there. I, I do like, for the most part, Bill Simmons, Ryan Rosillo. But some of these guys are over there are just hacks, to be completely honest. Like when we talk about Waz, this Justin Verrier guy who tweets in you know the middle of the game that Paolo had like 
seven turnovers and and five field goal attempts made or or five field goals made, whatever, said it might be time to have a conversation. It's the kid's first playoff game. He's 21 years old. He's been getting double and triple teamed all season long. And yeah, it was a a terrible game taking care of the basketball. He was the first person to say that in the postgame conference. But to like even suggest that it's time to have a conversation around a kid who's 21 years old playing in his very first playoff game who like hasn't had the opportunity of playing like in the national spotlight at all in the NBA so far. The OKC game in February and today's game against Cleveland are really the 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 most eyes that he has had on him in the NBA. It, it was just a ridiculous thing to say. And I didn't even like I didn't call him an idiot, even though he deserved that. I quote tweeted it and said, 21-year-old's first ever playoff game. Okay, buddy. And then the dude blocked me. He's been blocking Magic fans left and right. And he's been hiding replies on that tweet of anybody that disagrees with him. Don't tweet something so asinine if you don't actually want to have a conversation. Just go into your bathroom, make your own little echo chamber, and scream it into the night where nobody can hear you. That way you don't look like a complete moron. Yeah, the, the the irony of it all was that he said it might be time for a conversation, and then did not want to have a conversation at all. He didn't want to, and he so badly doesn't want to block me because I tweeted at him, and at the end, I quite literally begged him to block me. Uh, maybe because, that's the key. Maybe that's the key. He was like, "No, I'm not going to give this guy what he wants. He wants me to block him," and I genuinely wish he would because I want to laugh. But I did say. You know, someone asked me how many times that our friend Justin has tweeted about Paolo in the past. Hint, it's zero. Safe to say, the only other time Ad Justin Barrier has watched Bancaro play was our TNT game versus OKC. I'm ready to get blocked now, Justin. Eh, just crazy. And I, I did. I went to his Twitter and I searched. And actually, it wasn't zero, but it was good for the story. He's done it once. He's tweeted about Paolo once, and it was in 2022. And it was a reply to something, so like it doesn't really count. So probably when like <laughs> Palos first few weeks in the season or potentially when he was at Duke. Yeah, and I think it was just a conversation about him. I don't think it was an opinion either way. But it, I looked up Palo individually, then I looked up Ben Caro on this guy's Twitter. Hasn't said a thing besides the reply of the whatever unrelated conversation. Just an idiotic thing for that to be like your first thing said about one publicly. of the best young players in the league publicly. Yeah. It's that's just so just with with that platform like it it is it is irresponsible. Like it it is just a ridiculous thing to say. Yeah, it just shows me that you haven't like you're telling that that shows me you've watched no magic basketball this year. Yeah. Because media personalities that actually watch magic games or just games of teams in general will tweet about a great play during it, a bad one. Like he hasn't tweeted anything positive or negative. Yeah, we've we've given this guy more attention than he's given Paolo all year, and I'm <laughs> I'm pretty much over uh, giving this guy any attention. I thought I thought Paolo and Franz for the most part were, were really solid. Franz, I I know we've talked about it all year, and now you know, and there's been conversations you know around the the national media about what what's happened to Franz's shooting. I genuinely don't know. the The dude just has to figure it out this season. Like it's it's going to be so massive if he if he was the level of shooter that he was the the first couple of years. Magic Magic might win this game. They probably win quite a few more games this season, and we just desperately need that to happen. But the the fact that the game just didn't look too big for those guys, like Franz today, forty six percent from the floor. 206 from behind the arc, 18.7 rebounds, three assists, a steal, three blocks. And Paolo, 24.7 rebounds, five assists, nine of 17 from the floor, two of seven from behind the arc, four of eight from the free throw line. We, you know, we talked about that a bit. The nine turnovers. He talked after the game of how like he like never ever wants to do that again. Uh, so hopefully that will legitimately be the case. We've had you know quite a few high turnover games from Paolo Bancaro this season, but you know I, I'm gonna just sort of give this one away because it is his very first playoff game. Very anxious going into it. There's a lot of nerves, a lot of emotion. And hopefully, you know, he's going to watch film, you know, watch how these guys are are guarding him and, and sort of what tendencies they're playing to. And he'll just need to clean that up. But Paolo 
especially was like just really, really great in the first few minutes when you know, I think the Cavs got off to like a six nothing start with you know two big threes. And then Paolo comes like right back and gets you that first bucket, sort of put the rest of the team at ease. And like various points throughout the game, like when you really needed a bucket, he was able to go and do that. I I don't want to spend a lot of time like just harping on everybody else. Mo Wagner, I think, has the opportunity to be really important in this series just because of the fact that he can come off the bench and in 13 minutes gave you 10 points today, five rebounds, one steal, and is just that irritant that you you sort of need a guy like that in a playoff series. Joe Ingles has the ability to do that as well, but Joe Ingles just didn't really give you that same offensive contribution today. And the fact that like Mo is able to just come in, give you instant offense, and bring that level of like edge and just ugly and muck things up, I think that's gonna be, you know, I think that's gonna help him contribute to this series. A guy that, again, we've talked about this guy for weeks. I don't want to spend, I don't want to turn this into a whole segment, but Markel today, in almost 13 minutes, zero points, three rebounds, one assist, 0 of 4 from the floor. If that's the Markel Fultz you're going to get, it's going to be really hard to keep him on the floor. I don't think we're going to see the same type of offensive performance from Cole Anthony. Four points, 0 of 7 from the floor. But if those guys can't figure it out offensively, it is going to be really tough to play them in extended stretches. It was very telling in the second half. Cole Anthony, uh, in that first half, obviously the entire game didn't have a good shooting performance. That first half, he goes 0 of 5 from the floor. Second half, 0 of 2, and he plays a minute 48. Telling. And Markel Fultz plays six minutes in that second half and six minutes in the first half of two in the first half Mark Ellis of two in the second half. So yeah, I, we talk about guys getting played off the floor. Cole Anthony very much got played off the floor. He played um, under two minutes in the second half. This is a guy in a that game is, where you needed shooting, you needed offense. Yeah. And he's also like, uh, <laughs> How many how many minutes a game was Cole Anthony playing this year in the regular season? And and now in the second in this in this first playoff game, he logs under two minutes in the second half. He plays twenty two and a half minutes per game in the regular season. So what, like eleven minutes a half? So, and some of these guys' minutes are going to go down just because of, of the fact that the starters are playing more minutes. Like Franz, but, but, 37, but shy, Paolo, 41. But just shy of two minutes in the second half. That wasn't Oh, a, for sure. No, yeah. that's... So... That was a uh, choice. That wasn't a, you know... Yeah. yeah. That wasn't a we, byproduct I, of other guys getting more minutes. But to be honest with you, I'm I'm proud of Jamal Mosley for that. Because he so often is called like, hey, he's a player's coach. These guys love him. And I, I was really curious. Come playoff time, is he going to make the hard decisions? Or is he just going to be kind of labeled as the player's coach and not want to ruffle feathers too much? I'm happy that he did this. Who knows what Cole would have given you in the second half if you let him play a full load. I'm, who knows? But based on what you saw in the first half and him getting off to an 0-2 start in that second half... I'd say that was the correct decision. So I I think there was, I learned something about Jamal Mosley today and I was happy with it. Playing your guys like Paolo, you're in his first game playing him that many minutes. Play the entire first quarter. Yeah. Four, 41. Play the entire third quarter. Yeah. 41 game minutes played 19 in the first half, 19 and 30 seconds and 21 minutes and 44 seconds in the second half. Trusting in your guy that's been getting it done and trusting that he'll be good to go come game two. And and uh, we know he will be. In the media availability before the game, uh, when Jamal Mosley was asked about his starting lineup, he said that it hadn't been decided yet. And I think it was like a half hour before tip-off that we got the news that J.I. was going to be starting at the five. The reason that you do that, part of that is like to get the magic off to a good start. I hope... Game one, 
doesn't scare Jamal off of that. Like the Magic were what two of nine from behind the arc in the first. They're eight of twenty from the floor. If the offense was like even a little bit better, you know, you're only down, you know, maybe three or four at the end of that first quarter. And I just think that unit needs more time together, but like guys just have to be able to knock down shots early in the game. Luke, let's talk a little bit about game two. Like you you mentioned, the the old saying is that a playoff series doesn't start until somebody wins on the road. Mm-hmm. This is like, I have to think this is as bad as the Magic are going to be offensively in a series. You, This yeah. probably isn't like the worst offensive game or you know, this, this probably is close to, you know, one of the, the worst offensive games that Cleveland is going to have. They not by no means were not incredible offensively, but 44% from the floor and 26% from behind the arc. I would, I would, I would be surprised if they have a worse shooting game than that this series. For me, like it's just going to come down to the magic. Cannot shoot sixty three percent from the free throw line. You cannot shoot twenty one percent from the three point line. You cannot shoot thirty two percent from from the floor. We may have some some games in this that are one like one hundred and ninety five something like that. But like game two, hopefully the guys have just got all the nerves out of their system, and I I really don't want to see this magic team go down two games to zero. I, I I don't know if two two to zero doesn't obviously it doesn't feel like three to zero. We know that nobody's ever come back from from a deficit like that. But one and one coming home for game three with a a chance to go up two one in a series. I I, I know the Magic are going to bring it on Monday, and it would just be absolutely huge to pick up game two on the road. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh I can't wait for that because uh, truthfully at this point coming from the mindset of like, Oh, we're, I expect us to lose this series anyway, getting stealing one on the road, just cherry on top because like we've, we've achieved what we needed to do. We made the postseason. We're the freaking fifth seed. We're not favored to win this series. And if you can go in and win game two, goes without saying, but that is massive. Shows growth. Shows a lot of mental fortitude to shoot as poorly as you did in the first game and not let that get to you in the second game. The Magic could turn a lot of heads with a win in game two. In terms of like adjustments, again, I know we talked about this at the beginning of the the first, uh, you know, the beginning of the conversation here. Not to oversimplify it, but it really does feel like, like defensively, the Magic were solid today. I really truly believe that. You know, they had some lapses for sure, but overall, I felt like they were really really good. It it just feels like it's going to come down to whether or not the Magic can make shots, and we said that before the series. We said this whole series is going to come down to just whether or not the Magic can make shots. And role players play better at home. So even if you go down 2-0, you come home, you know that Jalen Suggs is going to get going in front of the, the Kia Center crowd. Hopefully Gary Harris can figure it out. Cole Anthony, Mo Wagner, Joe Ingles, all of those guys. You're going to need them. I just hope that we see desperation in, in Game 2. These guys not wanting to go down 2-0. And I want to see the same level of physicality. Sure, they were able to match that physicality game one. Cleveland did a good job of that, I felt like. But let's see them do it for six or seven games. I I still have doubts that they're going to be able to do that, where I know the Magic can sustain that because that's what the Magic have done all year. And, you know, Cleveland, they have every right to be confident. They look great today. They made the Magic look really bad. They're up 1-0 in the series, but... Like Lucas said, you know, everybody everybody talks when they're up. So, uh, yeah, let's just hope that we get a, a better result in, uh, in in game two. We're going to have another watch party Monday at Wall Street Plaza. Tip-offs at 7 o'clock. And then uh, win or lose, those guys are coming home for Thursday. Game three at Kia. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah, massive. Either way, like I said at the top, series doesn't start till the away team wins. So would it be discouraging to be down 2-0? You could look at it that way. But coming into game three, you have a chance to turn the tide. So regardless of Monday's game 
in the result. Magic fans have an incredible responsibility to show up on Thursday and give this team all they've got. Because all of a sudden, if you're down 2-0, guess what? You win that game, it's 2-1, and then you got another home game right after that, carrying all that momentum into game four. Anything's possible in these seven-game series, man. And every game holds a lot of water. But at the same time, the next game is only a game away, and you're only a game away from changing momentum. And, and this team can do that. So we'll, we'll see if how they come out in game two. But regardless, game three is going to be monumental and historic. And we all know that rest has been a, a factor for this team all year. You know, when they rest two or three more, you know, three or more days, they just always come out. They didn't come out flat today, but they just usually don't perform well in those games. You only have one day off in between game one and two. And then, yeah, you're going to have two days off between games two and three. We'll sort of see. I think that those guys being at home, it'll be a, a different level of energy. But, you know, hopefully today it was just like, hey, we got to get the rust out of the way. We got to get the nerves out of the way. You're not going to shoot. That's the good news. Like, you're not going to shoot any worse <laughs> than you did today. So hopefully that relieves, like, some of the nerves and the pressure. Like, hey, we're already sort of playing with house money. Nobody expected us to be here. There's no way we're going to shoot worse than we did in game one. So you might as well let it fly anyways. And what I will say, I just want to reiterate this. We're you know, really still at the beginning of this series. As long as the Magic keep this series somewhat competitive, like today, the result will tell you it was a blowout. It, it really wasn't a blowout. Magic were down 20 at the beginning of the fourth quarter, but were able to close the gap a little bit. In the last couple of minutes, yeah, this game got out of hand. But if the Magic are able to pick up a game or, or two games in this series and, and keep you know the majority of the other games competitive, this season is overwhelmingly going to be a success. And like, just don't let that get lost. Like, yes, it's okay to be frustrated about you know a, a single game. It's okay to be frustrated about the way that the series is going. But don't forget how valuable this is. Like, that to me is going to be the biggest takeaway this series. Just these guys getting this experience and seeing what it is like, and Jeff Weltman and Anthony Parker and the rest of the front office staff seeing like, okay. Yeah, we overachieved a little bit in the regular season, but this is what we know we're going to need in the playoffs to make this team successful. I feel like they already have like a good like pulse on that and what that is going to look like this summer. But oh, like everybody that I talked to before the game today at the watch party, everybody was like, "We're we're good. Like we're not supposed yeah. to be here." Right. So as long as this isn't just like a complete wash of a series, we're, we're going to be okay. Like we're we're sort of in that in that mode where we're. We're happy to be here, but yeah, it would be great to see some guys knock down some shots, Luke. Uh, anything else before we go ahead and wrap this one up? Oh, let's go steal one in Cleveland. Let's go steal one in Cleveland. All right, folks, that is going to do it for this one. For Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You all have been listening to The Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Six Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!